Chairman, we have the privilege of having Dr. Shelton Smith with us. He is the president and editor of the Sword of Lord and, and been there now for 25 years. And tomorrow is actually the 86th birthday of the Sword of the Lord. And they've been used all around the world. That ministry, sources, resources, that newspaper, all that has been used throughout the world. And uh, we are privileged to have uh, Dr. Shelton Smith with us this morning. Brother. Thank you, Brother Smith, very much. Take your Bible, please, and turn to Psalm chapter number 90. The Psalms and chapter 90. It is my joy to be at uh, Madison again, to be at Madison Baptist again. <coughs> I, uh, I've almost, uh, almost been here enough this year to uh, call it home. And uh, here for Super Conference, and was back again uh, a few months ago for a Sunday. And then uh, Brother Allison called again. And I appreciate uh, him entrusting his pulpit to me from time to time. Uh, over the years, uh, Brother Allison's become a dear friend. In fact, uh, Mrs. Allison and my wife have gotten to be friends as well. And uh, we're grateful for that. And I am delighted I get to pull him onto one of our programs just pretty often. Sometimes when I'm kind of pondering, you know, what I'm going to do with one of the meetings that, that we have. And I'll, I'll mention it to my wife, and, <clears throat> and she'll, say, uh, she'll say, well, you are having Brother Allison, aren't you? <laughs> now, the reason for that, she, she likes hearing him preach very, very much, as do I. And uh, almost everything we do, uh, we, we do try to get him if we can get him. And we appreciate it, and uh, it's a joy to be here, and uh, look forward to any time that he needs me. In fact, these last few months, and it's still th that way, uh, I have traveled very little since mid-March, and uh, honestly, I've enjoyed being home. <laughs> After 25 years, making 75, 80, 85 trips a year, uh, I've, I've just... Honestly, I've just kind of gotten spoiled being home these, these last few months. But uh, at the same time, I, I keep uh, every, every time when Sunday comes, and I love hearing our pastor preach, I, I enjoy going to church at Bellwood. But uh, every time it comes preaching time, I, I start saying, where's that microphone? Where's that microphone? I, I want to hang it around my neck. And uh, I think some of you probably, maybe all of you would understand that. But anyway, it's a delight to be here. And let's look at the passage, Psalm 90. It's 17 verses of it, and I will read all of it, and we will see what the Lord would give us here. This, um, this chapter, I will tell you, is, is one that I consider to be a mountain peak in the Bible. Now, there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible, and all of them are good. All of them are great. Uh, some of them seemingly rise just a little higher, and this is one of those chapters. Psalm 90, verse 1. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thy wrath, by thy anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants, 
and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. Now, just to take a look at some observations off of this chapter. Several great truths jump out at me when I read it. Uh, for example, in verse number 2, I'm confronted with the fact, the concept, the truth, that the God who is God, the God who is God, is eternal. Now, there are things, there are even people who claim to be a God. But, um, you know, you can, you can name things about whatever you want to, or you can call things about whatever you want to, but it doesn't make it real. And when somebody carves an image out of wood or stone or molds it with some other uh, component, and uh, it may be in the form of an animal, a form of a human, in form of an angel or whatever. Whatever they do in that regard, if they call it a God, it's a lie. It's not the truth because that's not a God. In fact, the God who is God is the only God. Now, we learn here in this second verse that he is the eternal God. He is, the, the passage says, from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. The first everlasting is pointing backward. The second everlasting is pointing forward. From everlasting to everlasting. Well, we look back, uh, where, where did it all begin? Well, it did not have a beginning because God has eternality. It's a part of his makeup. It is who he is. And so in all of the eons in the past, way beyond the age of the earth, way beyond the age of everything, even the age of creation, way beyond all of that, there is the God who is God. From everlasting to everlasting, beyond the present, into another endless stretch of eons eternally out into the future. Now, I make the point here and draw attention to that because uh, we, we live in, a, in, a, in an age, we live in a, a life where uncertainties abound. Lots of things that we don't know whether it'll be there tomorrow or whether it will not. But one thing is for certain, the God who is eternal is from everlasting through the present all the way into the eons of the everlasting future. Now, second thing that we need to notice here, down in verses 9 and 10, we learn that the rest of us, the rest of us are temporary. We, we do not have eternality. Uh, we had a beginning point. Uh, there was a time when we were born. At the point of our conception, we began. Life begins at conception. And so we had a beginning. Now, there was time prior to that. God was, God was there in all of those eternities uh, before that. But you and I were not. So we do not have an eternal past. But we do have an eternal future. Because once we are born, even, even if we die and are buried in the grave, there is an eternity either in heaven or in hell that is coming. And we, we will be alive somewhere in all of that endless eons of eternity in the future. But we are here on this earth, we are, we are temporary. The passage says our days are past uh, in, in thy wrath we spend our years as a tale that is told. William Shakespeare said, Life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Now, I don't know whether he was having a bad day <laughs> or what, but, uh, but he, he, really, he really does not express my sentiment there. You say, well, why doesn't he represent how you feel about things? Because I have things like Psalm 90 to work off of. Now, I understand I'm temporary, you're temporary, we're all temporary here. We're born, we live, we will die, either that or we get caught up in the rapture if the Lord returns. So we know, though, that this, this status here on earth is a temporary status. We, we understand that. 
Now, third observation off of what I just read to you, we do have a problem. We have a major problem. And verse 8 lays that out. It mentions our iniquities and our secret sins that are going to be uh, come before God, before thee it says, and they will be exposed in the light of God's countenance. Now, that, that little phrase, in the light of thy countenance. Oftentimes when I'm talking to someone, I've knocked on their door or I meet them on the street or wherever that I have the opportunity and I'm, and I'm in a one-on-one -on -one witnessing situation with somebody, I, I, I'm careful. I'm careful not to compare me to them. And you and I ought not to compare one another to each other. Uh, we, see, if, if, if I compare me to you and you compare you to me, what we'll start doing, we'll start saying, well, you know, uh, you know I'm not as bad as he is. I, I'm, I'm just a little better than he. I mean, that, that would be the logical thing if we compare ourselves to ourselves and among ourselves. But here's what will help us to see that we're sinners. There is a God in heaven, the great eternal God. He's not only eternal, but He is absolutely perfect. He is the epitome of holiness. And so here I come along and you come along, and in order for us to understand the dilemma that we have, and we do have a dilemma because when we are born, we're born sinners. And that, I mean, a day passes, a year passes, a life passes, that puts us in jeopardy. That is a major problem for us. What we need to understand early on is that we are sinners. Now, if we just compare ourselves to each other, we might say, well, you know, it's not all that bad. I think, I think I'll make it. But in the light of His countenance, in the presence of His holiness, comparing me to Him or you to Him, all at once we understand our deficiencies. We understand that we have messed some things up. So, do we have... You know, we, we like to talk about we made a mistake when it's a sin. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, psychiatrist uh, Carl Menninger years ago wrote a piece called uh, Whatever Became of Sin? Well, in these days you might ask yourself, whatever became of a lot of things that folks need to understand. Now, <coughs> here, we have, here, here we have this major problem presented our iniquities will be before, uh, open before God, our secret sins in the light of His countenance. So we, we do have a problem. Fourth observation off of this passage. Every one of us, no matter us temporaries, will be accountable to Him who is eternal. Look at verse 3 and verse 7 and verse 11. Those verses, 3, 7, and 11... They talk about, like verse 7 talks about being consumed by His anger and by His wrath are we troubled. Why are we troubled by it? Because we don't have an answer for it. We know we're sinners. Sinners, uh, sin, sin has a debt that has to be paid and, and we're not able to handle that. We're troubled by that. Uh, verse 11 says, Who can know the power of thy anger? I mean, if a great, almighty, eternal, holy God Vents his anger. I mean, what, what, what do us temporary, what chance do us temporaries have? Now, all of that leads me to back up to verse number one and tell you that there is only one place, only one, to which we can go for refuge. Only one. We, we, cannot, we cannot psychologize this. We can't uh, use some other gimmick of some kind to work our way around this. That's not going to play. It don't play in Peoria and it don't play in Huntsville. It don't play anywhere. There is only one refuge <coughs> for sinners. There's only one refuge for these temporary folks. I mean, we, we live and um, we have... 70, 80, maybe 90, maybe 100 years, whatever we have, we have that. And then we have to face God. 
Well, how are we going to do that? How can we possibly do that? Verse 1 says, Lord, by the way, that's a good place to begin. Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place. I mean, I mean, I mean this, this is where we can park. This is, this is where we can hang our shingle. This is where we can make our address. Lord, you have been our dwelling place. We're not much. We're just temporaries. We know you're the great God. And if we get sheltered where you are in your dwelling place, Lord, you have been our dwelling place. You have been our refuge. You have been the one to whom we could go. And that's been true in all generations. All generations. What, what was true then is true now and will be true hereafter. Because the eternal God tells us the right of it from the beginning. Uh, just 10 years ago, uh, 2010, my dad went to heaven. Uh, just four years ago, my mama went to heaven. Uh, about roughly 10 years ago, Betty's dad went to heaven. Uh, her mom went to heaven about 20 years ago, 22, 23 years ago now. And every time, with all four of them and others of our family and my 34 years as a pastor, many, many hundreds of times I stood with families when they were grieving. And uh, as pastor, many, many of the folks that, that we, we sent on ahead were people that I loved dearly. And, and I, I put the microphone on. I stood in front of them with my own family and Betty's family and others. I have, stood, I have stood in front of them at times when one of our loved ones had gone and our hearts were breaking. And I'm telling you, in such circumstances, I mean, we talk about when push comes to shove, whenever we are in dire straits, when our hearts are broken, uh, some, some silly little scheme, some, some thing that just popped up overnight, it's not going to do for us what we need to have done. We need something that is so solid, so concrete, I mean so precise that we can look at it and whether we're young or old, I mean whether we're educated or untutored, I mean whatever the case, we can look at them and I've done it in those funeral settings again and again and I've said, folks, the Lord is our dwelling place. He is the one to whom we can go. He is our refuge. We can look to Him. We can count on Him. We can believe Him. We can walk with Him. We can trust Him through every valley. We can. And the psalmist tells us, He is our dwelling place in all generations. It's true for the young kids, and it's true for the elderly folks and everybody in between. Now, these little handful of observations set the stage for the, the end of this chapter because it kind of, it's kind of like he, he weaves those truths together and then he begins to pray. And in verse 12, we pick up the prayer when he says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Now, numbering our days I think he's just saying you better learn to count like God counts. You better learn to figure like God figures. You better start to think like God thinks about all of this. All of our human reasoning, I mean, it comes unglued in a hurry. And so what he, what he says here is, you, dear God, teach us how, how to use these days and let us apply our hearts to wisdom. I, I hear people say, and, and rightfully so, they say knowledge is power. And it is. It is. But I know a lot of smart people who have a lot of knowledge <laughs> who don't know how to use it. And so knowledge needs a companion. And that companion is wisdom. And if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. James chapter 1. So we... We know that we, we, can, we can amass knowledge, but we need wisdom to go with that. Not, knowledge is the information. Wisdom is the know-how to use the knowledge. And what he says is, dear God, teach, teach my heart. I've got the knowledge. I've got the knowledge. Lord, teach me to apply my heart uh, with wisdom, what I know with wisdom. So 
I'm asking the Lord. Remember, I'm just a temporary. You're just a temporary. So in order, in order to make things right in these 70, 80, 90 years or 100 years we're going to get, we're going to look to the Lord and we're going to say, Dear Lord, teach me. Now, I'm going to own up to the fact that the day I was born, I had a lot in common with that box of rocks you've heard about. And I'm not going to indict you, but I kind of suspect you might have been in that same boat. Now, pretty early on, I began to learn. My mama taught me, my dad taught me, my grandparents taught me. Uh, my, my school teachers later would begin to teach me, my pastor would teach me, and I began to learn from a variety of sources what, whatever things that, that I've accumulated along the way. And all of that would be for naught. Because there's some things, well, some things you're going to have to look higher, higher than your daddy's head. You're going to have to look above the university. You're going to have to look beyond some of that. There's some things that you can get only from God. And he says, teach us. Dear God, oh, God, teach us. We need to learn what God can teach us. Now, second thing in this prayer, in verse 14, he says, satisfy us. Number one, teach us. Number two, satisfy us. Satisfy us early with thy mercy. I got saved right at my ninth birthday. That's fairly early. Somebody introduced me to the Savior, and I signed up that day. I've heard Brother Allison give his testimony uh, several times, and he mentions that uh, he was an adult, and yet he was a young adult. Now, wherever that you are in life, you, you, can, you can get hold of the mercy of God. It's available to you. The earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, the earlier you get it, the better. And he says here, satisfy us early with thy mercy. Now it's one thing for God to teach us. It's, and we could learn what he teaches us. But here, here's, a, here's a point that a lot of folks, I mean, no doubt there are people who walk through these doors every week who know, I mean, they know what you know, they know what I know, they know the things that are in the Bible, but they, they are as antsy as they can be. They're full of anxiety. They're, they're not walking with the Lord. They got, they got sins that they're hiding and, 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 and they're, they're grappling around with life in such a way that, what's the deal? Well, they, they have not looked up to God and said, dear God, I'm going to feast on you. I'm going, I'm going to quench my thirst on these great eternal things that you're giving me. Uh, that, that's why some folks can't, they can't set aside the trashy TV. They can't set aside the junk on the web. They can't, they can't feast and satisfy themselves on God's good things. And so what you and I need to do, yes, we need to ask God to teach us, feed us all of his things, but then we need to pray that the old carnal nature that we have will be so suppressed that we'll be satisfied, satisfied, satisfied with what God has given us. You know, my, my wife, Betty's a tremendous cook. You can probably tell by looking at me that, that she's a real good cook. And, uh, you know, she also thinks it's just me and her in the house, and, and she really believes that I'm the garbage disposal because anything that's left over, she, oh, there's only two bites of it. Why don't you eat that? And you know what I tell her often? I mean, this is a regular conversation in our house. <laughs> and what I tell her often I will, I will say, honey, the, you know, the, the chicken or the turkey or whatever it was, I, it was good. The green beans were good. I mean, the, the, the cauliflower was good. Well, there was only two bites left of it, but honey, I'm satisfied. I've had all I need. Now, you and I need to latch hold of that in relation to the things of God as well so that when somebody offers some flesh pot, offers some carnality, he, you say, well, some of the folks at the church are doing that. It doesn't mean you and I have to do it. And you say, well, how do you push things like that aside? You just pray, oh, God, teach me and then satisfy me with what I'm getting. And then the third thing in the prayer is found in verse 15 when he says, make us glad. 
make us glad. There are, there are things that have afflicted us. We're living in years when we've seen evil. The 2020 world that you and I live in, 2020 America, mercy. All of the things that are trashing up our world and trashing up our nation. And a lot of that's passing its way right into our town, down our street, and, and giving us stress. You say, what do we do whenever all of this tra uh, tra uh, tragic stuff and terrible... Uh, you, you and I need to back up. Lord, teach us, satisfy us, and make us glad. We must not let the purveyors of the trash steal our joy, take away our heart, get us discouraged, get us to the point where that we just give up and say, well, what's the use? No, we need to pray, oh God, make us glad, keep our heart joyful in the midst of all of that. We must not take intimidation by this crazy world that is, I mean, almost every day my phone rings and there's, there's something that, I mean, it makes you weep for the moment, but you hang up the phone and you cannot, you cannot ingest it so deeply that it brings discouragement and, and disheartens you. You say, but it's real. Yes, it's real. But you and I, learning what we know, just temporary we are, but we're connected to the great eternal God. And He's going to teach us and satisfy us, and He will continue to feed us the kinds of things that will keep our... That's why you need that fresh walk with the Lord every morning. To help you with your gladness factor. The prayer continues in verse 16. When He says, And let thy work appear unto thy servants. Now, he teaches us, gets us satisfied with his good things, and gets our heart glowing with the joy of the Lord. And then we're going to find out the Lord has work for us to do. He has a task for us. This part of the prayer says, Let thy work appear unto thy servants. If you look at that carefully, I believe I'm on track to tell you that the servants here are not setting the agenda. The servants here are not identifying the task. The prayer is, Lord, let thy work appear so your servants can see it. In other words, God sets the agenda. He tells us what the task is. And as his servant, then we say, oh, I see it now. I see what you have to do. Now, I look around this room, and I'm sure in normal times, and to some degree even now, there are any number of you, and maybe all of you. Uh, you, may, you may be helping with the Christian school or the bus routes or helping to clean the building. I saw some of you volunteer for that. Um, and, uh, or you may be, I mean, any number of things, working with children on and on. There's all kinds of things that are a part of the work of the Lord in Madison, Alabama, at Madison Baptist Church. Now, if I walk in the door... It's not my responsibility to do like I'm reading almost every day off of some of the evangelical uh, news feeds and stuff that I get at my office. They're, they're talking about, hey man, all this pandemic, we've got to rethink church and we've got to reinvent this and reinvent that. Now I have a theological word for that. It's hogwash. Yeah. All capital letters. The agenda is God's agenda. So if I get taught, I get satisfied, and I get the gladness of the Lord, and then I look up to Him and say, I want to be your servant, I will be your servant, and so you show me how I'm to do this. And He prays, uh, let thy work appear unto thy servants, and look at the last part of verse 16, and let thy glory appear, the verb there is understood from the first part of the sentence, let thy work appear unto their children. That is to the children of the servants of God. So if you and I get this thing going like we ought to, one of the pieces of the puzzle, he says, and by the way, your children, they need to see and understand the glory of God. Now, Betty, Betty and I have had this conversation. I'll just say we've had it many times over the years. We were blessed with a daughter 
and a son. I have said to her, she has said to me, we have said to each other in mutual conversation, if we fail at everything else we touch, if we did, and by the way, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a uh, advocate of failure. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not wanting to fail. I, I'm, I'm, I like being a winner. <laughs> I, I, like, I like to see things succeed. <clears throat> but if I fail at everything else I touch, she and I have agreed, but if we rear our children and if they catch hold of these good things and it becomes them, we are not failures. When we get old, we will not be failures. And I believe that. And what he says here is, you let me teach you. Let me satisfy you. Let me provide joy in your heart. You, you get hold of the work that I've designed. And then he prays, oh, and let, let thy glory, let, let, let the kids see it. Let the kids know that God's good. Let the kids know that there's a great God in heaven. You and I have the tremendous privilege of passing along the good things of God to those that are coming after us. We are so grateful the Lord blessed, enabled us with our children. Now they have children that are grown. And so we're trying to help them do it all over again with our six grands. Now, nothing, nothing any greater than that. Nothing any more important than that. The sixth part of this prayer is in verse 17 when he says, And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. I'm sure if you're looking my way this morning, if somebody were to ask you, uh, uh, just, uh, <clears throat> just give me one word to describe what you see, you probably would not have thought of the word beautiful. I would not think you would. But there is a very real sense in which I may possess and you may possess the beauty of the Lord God. You're not going to just wake up someday and say, well, I want to be beautiful for God. No, you're going to have to back up and let him teach you. And soak it in so much that you get satisfied with it. And you start living the joy of the Lord. And by the way, it's okay to let your face know it if you are joyful. It's okay. And all at once, something beautiful develops out of you. You may be tall, you may be short, you may be rich, you may be poor, you may be from Alabama or you may be from some other place. But you can demonstrate the beauty of the Lord God by letting the Lord work in your life. And, and I think it'd be good to say, oh God, do something beautiful through me today. That's a part of the prayer. There's enough, there's enough ugly in this world, enough ugly in, in Huntsville to ugly eyes all of North Alabama. Amen? You and I have the responsibility to make something different happen. Show the beauty of the Lord. And the last part of that uh, 17th verse says, part of the prayer, Establish thou the work of our hands, yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. You know, when I think about my two little hands, eight fingers and two thumbs, I mean, put a, put a hundred pound bag of something here and say, pick it up, man. I could probably do that. Okay, let's double it up. Put 200 pound bag of something there. I think I'm in trouble. I, I just, uh, there's just not much that I can do. It's the same feeling a lot of you have whenever Brother Jeff stands up here and talks about you going soul winning or door knocking or whatever's going on with the, with the visitation program on Saturday. <coughs> some, of you, some of you say, oh my, oh, you're looking at your little hands and thumbs and it's like, oh, I can't do it. This verse says, oh God, establish thou the work of our hands, yea, establish thou it. What he's saying is, dear God, Make, make my hands work. Make, make the work to which I put my hands, make it blossom, make it fruitful, make it productive, make it go. And so you and I, sons and daughters of the living God, we can do that. And when we do what we can do, then God will be the one that will, that will make it fruitful, make it produce. Now when, when Shakespeare said, 
Life is a tale told by the idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. When he said that, I mean, that survived as a popular quote. But I'm just telling you now, he was not talking for me. <laughs> he was not voicing my sentiments. I only use it here as a reference in contrast. I'm taking my cues from what I've just read and from what I've walked down through here with you this morning. That's where I want my, my life to center. He says, number your days that you may apply your hearts to the wisdom. You may have 75 or 80 or 85 or 90, whatever you're going to have. If by reason of strength you get more than the allotted time, whatever the case is on that, you and I have the privilege of knowing the great eternal God that makes it possible for us to do something that is significant. Not just a bunch of noise, but something that is significant. There's been more than one time, several times, through the years when somebody was trying to talk me into getting involved in a project of some kind, addressing something that really needed to be addressed. And I have said, I'm not interested in being part of a bunch of noisemakers. If you're just gonna make noise, I'm, I'm really, that, that, that's not, it's not worth my time. Now, if we're willing to tackle it and go after it and do what needs to be done and take the stand that we ought to take and stick with it, then I, then I may consider it. But to just be somebody making noise, that, no. Full of sound, signifying nothing, no, Mr. Shakespeare, No. I think he was having a bad day when he wrote that. You and I have the privilege to know the great God of heaven. We're just temporary, but he's figured out how to deal with our problem, our sin problem. I mean, he knows he's made arrangements for us. We will have to be accountable to him one day, stand before him. We'll, either li we'll live eternally either in, he in hell or in heaven, one or the other. When he sent Jesus to die on the cross, Rise from the grave, he paid the sin debt, that iniquity debt, that secret sin debt. He paid that debt that every man, woman, boy, and girl who was born will be born. Every last one, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God loved us so much, and all of the world so much, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That being the case, if you're in this building today or if you're watching me online and you don't have that settled, I want to ask you, would you settle it today? Settle it today. God's totally willing. He waits for you to be willing. He'll never force you to do it. If you're, waiting, if you're waiting for some kind of a huge push from him, he's already made the arrangement. And he's given us mind and heart to understand. And if you want to be saved, you can be today. There may be some of you who've already been saved. You made up your mind to come and be a part of this church. You need to come and say to one of the pastors here, I, I, want, I want to join, make this my church home. The door will be open here momentarily. Some of you may have been saved. You haven't been baptized. You want to come and say, I need to make arrangements to get baptized. Well, this is the place you can get it done. Let's stand up. We'll pray together. Thank you for listening. This is the most important time in this service. Somebody's life hangs in the balance. And if you're watching me or if you're here in this room, you haven't settled this issue of your salvation. Jesus died, rose from the grave to pay all the debt that you owe. So your, your, your bill's paid, and he offers it to you as a gift. And if you'll receive it and trust him, he will save you. Dear Lord, I ask you to do your work now. Show yourself strong. And I pray, dear Lord, for every person who might be listening to my voice that is unsaved, I pray this would be the day when they would trust the Savior. In Jesus' name.
Amen. The music begins. The altar's open. One of the men's here at the front to meet you and help you. If God's spoken to your heart about any matter, any matter, any reason why you need to come to the altar of God, you slip out and come while the music begins. Let's do it. Come on. Mm -hmm.